And, and Sarah, I'll just turn the time over to you to present. Perfect. Actually, I'll, I'll quickly throw it over, Leahy, if you had anything you wanted to, to say before we jump in. I can do my intro and jump right into things. No, I I'm not a, I'm not technical enough, so I'm I'm just I'm Perfect. just here with Sarah. But <laughs> I am local here to Utah, just just supporting her. But I don't have anything to add. She's pretty brilliant. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, hey everyone, Sarah Al Hayali. I currently um, I'm a solutions engineer for for Dynatrace. Um, worked there for about four years, uh, so pretty familiar with the AI ops and, and observability space. Um, so today we're going to cover that. Focusing mostly on on doing that in the cloud, especially as as more and more organizations are are shifting over to the cloud. Um, like I said, at any point, if you want if you want to interrupt, have any questions, just you know, feel free to let me know. Um, and then if you guys can see my screen, we can get started. Yep, I think awesome. we all see it. Cool. So the first thing we're going to cover is cloud complexity and how that makes observability a challenge. Um, covering mostly the fact that you know. Everything as we move over to the cloud is becoming dynamic, containerized. It's creating complexity and a scale far beyond what we've ever done in the you know the data center world uh, when things were on-prem. Um, beyond that, we're we're increasing volume, uh, variety, and velocity of scale. So we've gone beyond what can be managed on a dashboard. Or I feel, like, in my opinion, days of the knock and days of, of looking at dashboards are kind of behind us. Um, and what we're also doing is we're accelerating the frequency of change. So instead of you know releases happening every you know two times a year, people are doing them. You know we do we do them 26 times a year. There are organizations who do them multiple times a day. So being able to monitor that, be able to catch issues before they make it into production, um, fixing an issue when you have multiple things coming out in a day, that becomes an issue. Um, that becomes something that needs to be automated. It becomes something that can't be manually done because it's going to put a damper on how many things, how many you know changes you can get out. You know, are you letting in security vulnerabilities? Are um, you know the releases not up to par with what the previous one was, and, and things like that? Um, and applications are becoming way more important than they ever were before. Especially you know during the pandemic, everything has had to become a software company. Everything has moved online, you need websites, you need applications for everything. And if one thing is down, people are going to go to a competitor just like that. So making sure that you can monitor the cloud effectively, automatically, um, has become a, a critical part of a business su a success. Uh, beyond that, resources are limited. You have a DevOps team, that's probably all you have, doesn't matter how high it scales, how or what your resources are. And so those teams end up just focusing on fixing issues as opposed to kind of innovation and, and things that are, you know, a little bit more fun than that. Moving on, we're going to talk a little bit about the two approaches that we typically see with monitoring the cloud, and that is monitoring and observability. Uh, with monitoring, you have, it's, you know, the collection of the best in the breed tools. So you have a cloud monitoring tool, a log monitoring tool, a network tool, an APM tool, et cetera, et cetera move over to the observability side, we have metrics, logs, and traces that are all being pushed in from you know, a Prometheus or a Grafana or anything like that. They're put on a dashboard and then they're monitored usually through manual thresholds. The issue with that and the reason that this doesn't work um, is that it's still a lot of manual effort. There's no root cause. There's no you know, AI in the background telling you what the actual issue is. You're just getting a ton of events that are, that are constant noise. And you still have to dig through and try to figure, OK, what is the needle in this haystack? What is actually causing my issue? Um, the burden of actually figuring that out remains on the person who is doing the monitoring. The reason behind that is because the do-it-yourself or the multi-tool approach requires these six steps, which is A, we got to gather all the data. So we have to identify what we need to monitor. We have to script it. We have to add hooks in. We have to figure out how are we actually going to get this data into whatever big data repository that we're going to put it in. Once you've done that, you then have to actually understand what this data is. So you have to organize it. You know, what are the relationships? You have to manually build out a topology uh, or a CMDB. What are the baselines? What is the actual performance? You know, do we want to set manual thresholds? Where do we set those at? Um, and things like that. And then once you've done that, you then have to suppress all the noise. Um, the issue with that is that you might suppress things that are really important. You don't, you, you don't know what's noise and what's an actual issue. 
So maybe you get in like a correlation engine or, or something like that to then monitor where that noise is coming from. Then you build out a dashboard. And then once that's done, you have to repeat it and you have to scale it for another application or a new technology that's brought in or a new dependency that's built out um, or anything like that. And that becomes a issue as we move up to the cloud because at a certain point, as you know, you there's early adoption in the teams, it's not really much of an issue. We have single apps that are being lifted and shifted, it's fine. But as we move further and further into the dynamic multi-cloud and being native to the cloud, this becomes an issue uh, because the scale of the resources that are being used, the issues that are popping up, the events that are coming through just cannot be handled by a manual person. Um, what we currently do when you have things like this is try to correlate that. So like I mentioned, you can maybe use a correlation engine or something. You set all your events to something else that'll try to find the issue for you. But the issue with correlation instead of AI ops and end causation is that with correlation, you can get a lot of things that aren't really issues. Um, so you probably have data in a whole bunch of tools. You have, an you know, like I said, infrastructure, customer experience, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and those individual sources of data require you then to then try to make sense of it. So you'll look at it and you'll say, okay, you know, this showed me that there's a spike in resources at the same time as a response time error on this other thing. So those must be correlated. Um, and it's kind of a lot of guesswork behind there. And where this is con can cause issues is that just because two things happen at the same time doesn't mean that they're correlated so, or that they're related to each other. So if you look at this example, um, see the number of pirates that we had from 1600s to now has gone down a ton. We also have seen a increase from the 1600s to now in temperature. You put those two things in a correlation engine, you're going to get told, OK, if you increase the number of pirates, the temperature is going to go down. Like That is our root cause, um, which obviously is not the case. Um, so a new way of approach is needed. We need something that is not going to be focused on correlation, something that is um, focused in AI, something that is focused in continuous automation, something that has intelligent observability, meaning that not only is it taking in the events, but it also understands how they're related to one another. You know, pirates and temperature have no actual relation. Um, so building out a topology and really understanding an automatic topology that grows as your environment grows um, and something that can be used amongst multiple teams. So it's, you know, instead of an uh, APM and then a network tool and then a front end tool and, and all of those things, something that does all of those together so that you're reducing the noise and the alerts from each one of those. Just want to pause real quick. Um, does anyone have any questions? Uh, anything they, they want to share? Some, if you guys have any kind of stories on how you currently do things, that would be really interesting too. Sarah, I had a question and maybe you'll hit on it more in, as you go along the uh, presentation, but like correlating when you when you have a large uh, microservice application with many mm -hmm. dependencies, um, how do you determine like those dependencies where wh what the, what the root cause of the error is? So maybe the symptom might be mm -hmm. just slowness or random failures here and there. Um, that's the thing that's always difficult when you're just looking at things with uh, individual yep. metrics and putting those all together. Exactly, absolutely. So that's actually exactly where we're going next. Um, and it's it's how do we do that in a way that doesn't require looking at individual metrics and trying to figure out, you know, what what impact does it have on the rest of the application? Which one is the, the first thing that caused an issue? Um, and, and that approach is by taking similar steps to what we did before, but doing it in a way that scales and doing it in a way that does not need the manual effort of the setup. So something that doesn't need scripting, um, being able to install something that then does the automation for you, builds out a topology mapping. So we be able to feed that information into, for example, your service now CMDB that has a topolo the po topology of all the dependencies in your environment. So we actually have an understanding of A talks to B, which talks to C. So if there is an issue with, with C, we know exactly what it depends on and we can then pinpoint the issue a little bit faster than if we got alerts from all these things and we don't know what the what the correlation between them is. Um, so putting it actually into context and as opposed to just kind of noise. Um, so once you gather that data, pulling it into a repository that can organize it for you, something that does automatic baselining as opposed to manually setting thresholds, um, 
you know, we've, I've, I've seen it a million times where we'll have, um, because I work in the observability space, we'll work with folks who have set their, their thresholds manually um, on things that they think are their, their key services, their key requests and things like that. Um, when we kind of take this approach instead, we'll then find some random, you know, like a random token that they didn't even realize was expired from years ago. They never thought to put an alert on that's been causing an insane slowness on their application. Um, so when you try to, you don't want to suppress noise without knowing what's actually noise. That's why you want to kind of put that in the hands of uh, an AI as opposed to yourself, because it's always going to be something that you never really considered to be an issue. Um, and then moving on beyond that, being how people to have, you know, out of the box dashboards, dashboards that you don't have to actually sit there and build out yourself or stare at things that'll alert you as soon as there's a problem. And one that scales. So as your environment changes, you don't have to touch what's on your what's on your server. You don't have to touch what your, your setup, it's gonna scale with you. And what that does is instead of saying, okay, we gotta reduce the number of pirates or we gotta increase the number of pirates and the temperature is gonna go down, is we understand everything and the way that it's connected. So we have a giant, you know, domino circle here. And when all of them fall, we can then, because we have the topology mapping, because we have the understanding of everything and its dependencies, we can then follow every single domino all the way to the front, to the first one that fell and be like, there's your root cause. This is the cause of everything that happened after it, uh, because we're monitoring every entity. That's opposed to, say, if we set some manual thresholds, we only pick the really important dominoes, we might miss the one that actually fell. Awesome. Um, any questions from anyone at this point? No, that's great. Cool. Okay, moving forward. So just kind of going into what observability really is, as opposed to just traces, metrics, and logs, it's tying it into that additional context, the topology, the behavior. So everything might be running perfect from a backend perspective, but if the user behavior shows that there is an issue, then there, you know, the AI is going to catch that. Um, so we we'll be able to then pinpoint something a little bit deeper in that, understanding the code, the metadata, the, the way the network impacts it all in one tool, as opposed to multiple that might send kind of events to a team that might not look at it, or a team that might think, okay, this isn't actually, you know, it's a front end problem, not really related to me, kind of things like that. Then a bit more of a visual representation that's not dominoes. Um, you can say here, okay, we have a front end application, it's having an issue. It talks to the web server cluster, but those aren't having issues. We see that because we're monitoring the entire topology. So that's fine. We see actually that Node.js microservice has an issue. That microservice cluster doesn't have an issue. Again, not the root cause. We go further and we set the Golang service does. Um, and instead of manually having go, to go in to, and, and do this, having an AI that looks at that, having an AI that then monitors that for you, you can be like, oh, okay, the, the Golang service is the root cause. You get that immediately sent to you as opposed to these four different alerts, uh, which may cause you going into, you know, this open shifts, the Docker container, these Linux hosts, trying to figure out, you know, which one's actually causing something. And then moving past that, so say, okay, we have this, we have AOPS integrated, we have, we're monitoring our applications, we have, you know, root cause analysis there telling us exactly what is causing the problem. How can we then put that in a way where we can hands off keyboard, get new releases out there faster, um, kind of focus more on innovation as opposed to, you know, finding issues in code. Um, and that's using through to quality aids. So this is just a quick survey that we did uh, amongst our teams um, or amongst our clients at one point, just to see, okay, who's actually implementing quality gates? You know, where are they being used or, or how are they being done? Um, and about 48% of them were manually implemented while only 10% were automatic and the rest just haven't defined them or haven't done them. Um, and the reason for that is it is a lot of manual effort to then feed that data in. They're really hard to define. There's a lot of interpretation as to what you know is a good result, which what is not. It slows down development of actual code, and there's no stable environment to get predictable results. So what this what we can do with this is you know focus on SLIs, SLOs, and SLAs, integrate that with what we were doing with AI ops, and create quality gates so that only quality code is is making its way through. Um, so. If we say, okay, our SLI is X should be true. And we define that as 
um, you know, business availability, for example. Our SLO is 99% of the time. Um, and the SLA is, that is our contract with our, our accounts. So that's something we have to do. Um, so how do we then do that with AI ops? You know, how do we make sure that we finalize payments in the 95th percentile in 1.5 seconds um, and things like that? Um, and so once you define what is critical to you, um, what we can do is then set tests. Say, okay, since we're monitoring all of this in, in an AI ops kind of tool, in a tool that we're able to automate this and hands off, we can then set these, these thresholds. We can then say, okay, we want our authentication service to, this is what is a passing for our authentication service. Um, this is what's not passing for our service X. And only move things over when they're fully green. If they're not, we, we using our AI ops engine, using our root cause analysis, find what the issue is, scale it back, try again. And then we just keep doing it uh, without with hands off, you know, oh, we push a new build, there's a high CPU, um, let's fix that and then try again um, until you have, you know, your quality code being pushed through. And so an example of that and something actually recently implemented um, with one of my accounts is kind of the, that shift left of, okay, we're gonna run, build one, authentication service was great, service X was not. That's a you know red light over here, so we're not going to pass it. Authentication service and service X failed on the, when we tried to fix it. We're going to keep trying. Um, and we keep doing that over and over again until we hit build three, where yeah, build or build four, which yeah did have a little bit of an issue, but that has passed our overall criteria without having to do anything ourselves. We can push that into production, um, allowing us to get you know those those multiple releases a day, multiple releases a week out. So Sarah, in, yeah. and maybe you'll hit on this on, so how do you simulate those loads then in a test environment? Does, is there, yeah, are so, there, is there a tool or you've got to create custom tests to do it or? So usually, yeah, you could use any kind of load testing tool to do that. And and if we feed into kind of in the example of, of my sense where I've, I've mostly worked with Dynatrace, if you into Dynatrace, a load balancing tool will still count as traffic. So you'll still be able to, to test that out, make sure that it, it passes and then and move it along. And Sarah, can you give maybe some, mm -hmm. you mentioned a couple slides ago, quality gates. What are some examples of a quality gate? Yeah, so a quality gate is actually, let me go back. Is, is anything you want it to be. So when we were looking at this example here, um, a quality gate is something that's saying, okay, we've defined these are as our SLIs. These are the SLOs that we're gonna measure against to make sure that they hit. Um, this is why this is not as relevant to the quality gate, but this is kind of the business reason as to why you're doing it. And, and this is what would you, we would use for a quality gate. So we have a new release, we push that. We have a, our, you know, a tool that will then go, okay, the availability is, is stellar, we're fine. The response time is that 1.5 seconds that we had wanted to hit. Um, we had the max number of users that we want to be able to handle, and there wasn't uh, more than a 5% incre increase in our heap usage for our JVM. So that would be a quality gate. So you want to make sure your build hits all four of these before you move it into production. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. So would each of those, like on the left, of finalized mm -hmm. payment 90 fit? percentile would that be one quality gate or a combination of all those is a quality gate it, it's and not or yeah so this would be all um, of them yeah okay okay cool does anybody else here use anything like a quality gate at, at an account any like a at their company interested in implementing them or i know we do yeah. but we probably mm -hmm. haven't called them quality gates for coming up with yeah. you know is everything has so many names, yeah. Yeah, so that's why I just wanted to make sure mm -hmm. I understood that, but it can be difficult to define them, right? It, yeah, are I, you at the stage where you're looking to define them or have you guys implemented them? We've been implementing them, but mm -hmm. you know, the, the common thing I'm always chasing is, is just um, standard metrics on OS level things that, you know, they, they measure, memory, CPU, load, all those kind of network traffic. But at the end of the day, as you mentioned in a previous slide, what's the, what is the customer experience? You know, yeah. so when, when we get help desk requests that, hey, the application is running slow, and then 
you talk to the DBA, it's not database looks good. And you talk to the hosting people, all the metrics look good here. Exactly. But so that, it's a lot of finger not, pointing. It's all yeah, in different it's not, tools. It's not yeah. really helping the help desk at all because yep. at the at the end, the end user is not happy and we need to find out why. And that's where I find problems with, you know, do-it-yourself metrics right now is it yep. usually is just looking at the area of infrastructure that you're over and you really need a holistic type of view, right? Absolutely. And that's why the, the SLA section is wouldn't be implemented within the quality gate itself, but it's still like a, in my eyes, a requirement to define, like there has to be some kind of business reason as to why we want those to avoid the need of like, okay, I just want every metric I can get so that I can have it. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. And so that, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, if there's others that have questions, feel free to, mm -hmm. to speak up or just put it in the chat. I don't mean to consume the whole, all the questions. So. Yeah. So Thanks, quality sister. gates was, was where I was looking to kind of move towards more and more questions and understanding and kind of turn this more into a conversation. Um, in terms of slides, there's, I, I might have a few at Dynatrace if people are interested, but that's, that's about it. Um, so I'd love to, if, if anyone has any, any stories or, or anything they kind of want to, want to share as anyone, like I, I know Brett, you shared yours, but in terms of quality gates, um, has anyone here gotten to that point or are they kind of in a previous stage in, in terms of their monitoring goals and then what would that be? Kind of a quiet group tonight, looks like. But I I guess some more questions I would have on the topic of AI mm -hmm. ops is because you, you've kind of talked to this at a high level. Um, but most of us if we've done any type of AI work or machine mm -hmm. learning, there's a lot of um, pre-work in building models and analyzing data. And that takes a lot of work. Um, yeah, and that's um, that's when you do AI ops, trying to use you know machine learning as opposed to topology. Um, so with machine learning, that there's going to be a lot of models that need to be built, different algorithms to implement and test out. Um, but when you approach it more from a topology understanding, and actually I'll just quickly I'm not going to get too much into dietary stuff, but I will quickly just jump into one slide that shows the topology that I'm referring to, because then it'll help. So say every single one of these components that we see here is some kind of service. If you understand, okay, this one speaks to this one, this one speaks to this one, this is our dependencies. When one of them goes red, we then have a full understanding of everything else that is impacted. And then we can also help identify, okay, which one was the first one to drop? Which one was the first one to have an issue? Um, were there any code changes recently on those components? Okay, that's, there we go, that, that's our root cause right there. So it's all about making sure that you feed all of the context that you could possibly have into one place. Because I think the, the biggest issue that we run into is that folks will use a ton of different tools that all have different levels of context, or they'll try to build it themselves and not push all the metrics that might be relevant. They'll instead push all of their infrastructure metrics that they really want or things like that. Um, so having all of the important contacts in there, the understanding of, of relationships and, and things like that um, is, is critical to then identify, okay, this is what the root cause is. Okay. So you call that, it's topology yeah, monitoring it's versus, versus like a machine learning type of thing. Exactly, yeah. Okay. So other questions from the group? How how are others doing their uh, monitoring at their organizations? Is it, I know a lot from my experience is a lot of, a lot of people do homegrown things at first and spend, you know, cause at, almost out of necessity, you need something. And exactly. And it's usually once you try to, try to scale it out to, to other teams, teams that, that you run into that issue. issue. Uh, well, I pass through pretty much um, all possible uh, scenarios uh, from homegrown to open source to SaaS plus open source to SaaS minus open source. And um, uh, what I find, uh, there, is a, there is no recipe. <laughs> uh, it's uh, it, 
in, in some situation, uh, yes, you need to uh, pay somebody who uh, do the heavy liftings, and in some situation, it so depends on the scale, like requirements for scalability. It so depends on like what you're observing. It so depends on uh, what kind of situation you have, or what kind of contractual obligation you have, what kind of um, uh, what kind of standards. Uh, is there like things like PAP? Mm -hmm. Is there things like DOD involved? Uh, so there is no uh, cookie cutter, but. Thank you for the interesting uh, overview. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. and I, I, I agree with that. There, that. Uh, there, there is, is no cookie, cookie cutter, cutter approach, approach, especially when you have, have a million different, million different languages. languages. Some, some that can, can be, be, you know, yeah, automatically exactly. instrumented with some like bytecode instrumentation. Some that have to be, you know, hands-on code changes. Um, every environment is different, which is uh, why it's important to have that kind of something. Something that then learns with that. Uh, although, uh, to, to be honest, I mm -hmm. always use the AI in maybe slightly different, uh, uh, in, in slightly different way or definition was the AI mm -hmm. in that uh, in, in that respect. Uh, so generally, I use the artificial intelligence to actually uh, solve the not the generic but more practical uh, tasks in observability. Yeah, can you well, give can me an example, example of what you mean by that? that? Uh, well, so like one of my uh, favorite is uh, pattern matching. Mm -hmm. uh, like uh, if you uh, if you have a certain sequence of uh, telemetry items and you need to uh, figure out is the pattern of A and pattern of B match something and they match uh, some patterns at the same time. So that's one of the examples. And in that example, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little, little echo from yours. But in that example, is it do you do you have to have a lot of models before that? Uh, well, uh, model. Well, uh, the number of the models when like, the the number of the variations of the patterns uh, infinite, but the number of the variation of the patterns that you are looking for are not infinite so uh, actually the number of the models that you need to use and train like for example neural net is generally it's a within one or two dozen unless you're looking for something really complicated okay Yeah, and that would be more of a, a machine learning approach, in, in my opinion, if I'm understanding correctly what you mean, which is why it's uh, it's important to kind of make that distinction of, of machine learning as a subset of AI, so not, not all AI is going to be in that, in that kind of perspective, but um, it is an approach we see often, so that, that does make sense, yep. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. So Sarah, kind of along the lines of, mm -hmm. of the artificial intelligence, and I dabbled with this, but I'm not a machine learning expert, so I haven't been able to really find a good solution. But like like I work in a pretty large application, multiple microservices, and we have uh, audit logs of what's going on in the system. Mm -hmm. And I've often thought if I could take all that data and create, run it in a machine learning, learning environment, that I could start to maybe correlate some activities of why do we get random slowness in production that we don't see elsewhere? Um, and being able to tell the kinds of services that may be creating that. But I realize I think it's kind of a combination of that and that one is kind of a black box looking at the results um, with a whole bunch of data. 
versus topology would be being able to see in real time how the components are interacting with each, yeah. with, with um, each other. And, maybe and I actually, I, I, I worked in machine learning in a previous life. Um, I used to do research uh, in healthcare, actually, and my focus was on um, being able to identify what stage of bladder cancer a patient was at based off of the, the cells in their, their blood samples. Things like that is where I find machine learning is a good fit because that is going to stay consistent. The number of uh, the, the T cells that are in you know, someone's blood sample based off of their you know, diagnosis is going to stay the same for their stage. With comes to things like observability, um, very different career paths. Um, I, I find that it, it's not quite a fit because that is going, your topology, your environment is constantly changing. So you may have a model that has learned really well over what your application currently looks like right now, but then as you change it in a week or two, it has to then learn again. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so so from what you're saying, you haven't found from the two two worlds, it's hard to to marry the two together. It is, uh, but with the topology, the topology learns as you change. So yeah. having that as the the core of how, how we understand an issue, that is going every time you add a new component, the AI is going to understand that as opposed to trying to look at the set um, previously, which did not have those components in it. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else have any questions? Um, I'll be back. Uh, I don't want to steal the stage, but uh, Go another for it. thing, uh, what I find, uh, the single approach, uh, like, okay, we're going to use like an AI uh, for that. And for that, a single approach is good, uh, but combination of the approaches, let me bring the example. Uh, uh, what I also uh, practice is the combination of creating the uh, optimization models and uh, studying the, uh, the, out, the, the patterns that's the outcome of the applying the data that I get from the optimization models into the real life. So like, for example, I'm building uh, the system of uh, linear equations uh, that's minim like minimize or maximize the parameters in my environment that I want to achieve. And uh, because I'm applying uh, the solutions that I get after the using that optimization, and I get some pattern, I study the pattern, I change my model, I study the pattern, change my model, and until I achieve something which will be satisfactory. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. That, that that sounds that good. good. That's that's, that's, that's kind, kind of some of the thoughts I'm wondering if, if you can find a pattern in in use cases and determine when beforehand what when you're gonna have like slowness or failures. Um. Well. Uh, again. Uh, in. In a few minutes, it's really hard to explain. But again, uh, the of when when you start to work with the patterns, uh, it is a very so, sometimes you uh, work with the actual patterns, and some t that represents something exists in the physical world, like uh, disk utilization or mem memory utilization, and so on. And sometimes you just begin to create uh, the more or less artificial criteria, which result of the computing of the uh, some number of the uh, real telemetry items and that computation is representing some process that you have inside your environment and then you study the pattern of that of that representation, if you wish. Um, like one of the examples that I can take, I, 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 can, I can bring uh, on the table is, uh, like for example, uh, the well, uh, Jesus, uh, the load average. <laughs> 
although it is a not uh, uh, not uh, it is already computed uh, computed telemetry, but it is a represented uh, number of changing of the load average represent, representing number of other pieces of the telemetry. So you can create a load average for your website and take similar approach. And uh, study load average for the website, study load average for a uh, disk subsystem. Study desired load average. Again, examples could be numerous. Yeah. 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 Sorry, go ahead, Brett. Did you have anything to say? No, go ahead. I was just going to say it's really, really interesting as an approach that I haven't actually uh, run across. So it was, it was interesting to hear that. I'd be curious to hear kind of some some real world examples of, of things you guys have caught and how you've, you know, like, like, is there also, have you gone past the, this is how I find the root cause to kind of more automated, like root, like um, rollbacks or anything like that. And like taking that like AI and, and moving beyond finding the issue. Uh, you're on mute, sorry. Uh, the examples I brought so far is mm -hmm. mostly from the uh, optimization of, and the performance uh, world, which is also part of uh, observability. Uh, but uh, root cause analysis, um, again, uh, in my like when I was involved in that, uh, the root cause analysis does include also uh, different types of the analysis, uh, beginning statistic, begin starting from statistical analysis, and actually um, the neural networks and an analysis of the patterns and analysis of trends. It is a probably last piece in the chain of other analytical steps that you made, and uh, the very the very outcome, of course, will be hint about the root and uh, root cause, because I would be care like especially when you begin to tune the system, I would be careful to say. Uh, yeah, that's the root cause for that. But first step uh, for that system is to probably not to actually find the root cause, but actually reduce the number of the visible metrics. Um, like one of the uh, things which I, when I uh, train the students in observability, I usually tell them, uh, you need to decrease the, decrease the number of the metrics that you are seeing. And that is one of the primary goal that you have because you are drowning in the metrics. Like every host, every application generates you hundreds of the metrics. And to some applications you need this subset, to some applications you need to do this subset. So maybe you need all of them, but you don't need all of them simultaneously for the same application. Uh, and uh, the method of using combining of the statistical analysis uh, with the some uh, pattern uh, matching is in fact uh, one of the methods of reducing the number of the metrics like one of the examples i usually give to the students like uh, you, you know what happens in 1986 in chernobyl power plant so um not the root cause of, of the event but operator at that plant had a necessity of observing about 2000 real uh, real time parameters which is close to impossibility so Actually, step number number one is not finding a root cause. Step number one is to decrease this ocean 
of the telemetry into the something than, that you can work with. And once you achieve that smaller number, some of them will be representative, like load average, like generated uh, telemetry. Uh, when you get the lower number of the telemetry that you deal with, so you can begin to build your root cause analysis models. That's really interesting. Are you, uh, what do you what teach, do you like teach high, school, high school, university? university? I... Just... Oh, sorry, you went on mute again. <laughs> sorry that I keep doing that. I don't mean to. Uh, uh, I used to, when I, when I used to work for Zabbix, I don't know if you know that product. Uh, one of the part of my responsibilities was like to actually train how to organize the observability. Okay, oh, that's cool. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, we cool. use we use Zabbix. That was one of the early monitoring tools. Actually, it's uh, I'm not working for Zabbix anymore, uh, but uh, it is uh, actually pretty active uh, tool, uh, and I won't recommend it for every application, but I do recommend it for certain applications. And in some applications, it's pretty much indispensable. Yeah. yeah. I know a lot of our hosting Hosted folks, folks use, it. use it. But like I say, I, it seems like I steal the stage. Uh, maybe somebody else have a questions or remarks or whatever. I'll I'll go in the mute. <laughs> no, no, thank you for sharing, that. keeping the conversation alive. That was that's really really interesting to hear. Yeah. Uh, I know we're. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, I know we're running out of time, Sarah. I don't know if I mean if you want to describe a little bit what Dynatrace does on how they saw this at this level. Because I, I, I'm sure a lot are like me, I'm always looking for the new great monitoring tool. And I think it's, is, is it Vladimir? Is that right? Um, yes. Yeah. 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 I, agree. I agree. There's, There's never, never a single, single silver, silver bullet. bullet. There's, There's lots, lots of different, different things. things. And, and if you've done this you've done long, long enough, you usually look, look for, for Common, common problems, problems like, like with the database, database uh, and, then and then errors, errors happening happen in the service, but, but sometimes there's just, just weird things, things that happen, that happen and you can't, can't tell, tell what's happening. Um, yeah. the, biggest, the biggest problem of the monitoring is in fact, it's very easy to organize the data collection. Well, at least it's doable. But once you have this data, what are you gonna do with it? Yep, exactly. <laughs> that's the biggest problem. That's the biggest problem of the monitoring. Yeah. Yeah. So I can I can quickly touch on Dynatrace a little bit. Um, yeah. So the way Dynatrace approaches observability is through an agent approach. So what we do is um, what we refer to as a one agent that we put on our servers. Um, so that kind of handles the obviously the infrastructure metrics, your disk, your CPU, all of that. Um, but what we've done with our agent is actually it's it's a bunch of different processes in our agent, and what that all those processes you have like a Java one, a .NET one, a, a C one, you know every language that we could possibly instrument automatically, um, kind of built in there. So then if we see a Java process in there, as soon as it's spun up, we'll do we'll hook into it, we we'll do some bytecode instrumentation to then grab that code level. Um, so what we'll then do from there is all those one agents that are all on your servers, all of those services that are communicating every single time that Java process calls a database or um, a front end application hits a button that, that calls something that's on the back end, um, we'll be able to correlate those. Uh, Cause what the one agent also does is if we're installed on like the server that actually builds out your application was we can inject a JavaScript into that front end too, assuming it's like a HTML application. Um, so that we have that full end-to-end -end view all on the same platform. 
um, and what that gives us. And I'll quickly share back my screen. Uh, I hope you guys can see it. I might be a little bit <laughs> blurry, but I'll, I'll describe it. That gives us, as opposed to a bunch of events, you get what we refer to as our problem card. And what that does is, OK, we've seen a whole bunch of events come up at the same time. Um, because we understand the topology, because we're seeing the front end and, and the things it's calling on the back end that are also having issues, we're able to put all this on one problem card for you. It'll tell you, um, it's a little blurry, but you'll see here like 276 impacted users, 3 million or 4 million affected service calls. Those aren't you know events that you need to get. We're, we're tying the issue to the business impact as well. Uh, we'll tell you, okay, the problem card was opened up because your front end application saw an increase from the, the baseline that we automatically detected because our one agents will automatically figure out what is the normal um, behavior for your application um, and then send you an alert if it you know increases above that but because we're monitoring changes that come in from you know your cmdb or it could be anything um, that you use to, to monitor your changes or code changes um, and we're monitoring the back end as well we'll be able to say okay we saw there's like a deployment change on the service that feeds this application at the same time that a problem started they're all having issues. We don't need alerts for you know the 10 servers that were affected or the one application or the two other infrastructure components. We're gonna send you one alert for all of this and we're gonna let you know that this deployment change was, was your root cause of your issue. Um, so we kind of take away of the manual need to look through all those metrics or to, to build the model or to, to set the thresholds. Um, we're kind of trying to make a bit more of a hands-off approach because what we can do is now we know, okay, this deployment change caused the issue. This deployment change, say it's sitting in ServiceNow, we can then tell ServiceNow, hey, roll that back. Um, so we don't even like a hands-off approach, um, automatically send like a webhook from Dynatrace to ServiceNow to roll back a change, for example. Great. Awesome. Any questions from anyone on, on kind of the, the dying trace side of things and how we approach observability. Pretty quiet group, but Sarah, I sure appreciate you presenting and Vladimir, I appreciate your impact or your comments. That, that was interesting. And I always like to find someone who worked on Zabbix. That's pretty impressive. We still use it. So I, 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 uh, I really appreciate that tool and what it does. Um, uh, anyway, we, uh, we appreciate Dinah Trace coming, Lehe and Sarah, thanks again for volunteering. Um, we should talk some more on maybe other possible presentations. I, one thing I think a lot of us struggle with is just what you're, you're saying is like, like Vladimir mentioned, you'll see lots of metrics. I, I, I had this very discussion today where we're building a Grafana chart and the technical people, okay, here's all the stuff. What do you what do you want to look at? And it, it's really hard to just pick them yeah. out. It, it's a lot of experimentation. And what I find is really without involving almost the complete team with development and testing and doing it all together uh, as you're developing, it's really hard to do those metrics after the fact. And then yeah. uh, and that's kind of where integrated teams are 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 pretty vital. So it would be interesting like see like a use case or a typical what what maybe Dynatrace does when they come into a company and how they help them instrument their application, you know, for a yeah. company that maybe has never done that before. Cause I'm, it's one of those things you kind of learn from experience and I'm sure your company does that all the time. So. Yeah, absolutely. That'd be, let's, uh, Leahy and I are, we'll, we'll see if we can come up with some good stories. Okay, great. Uh, we're about out of time. Any other questions from the group? Uh, we are recording this, so I will post it on our YouTube channel in the next 24 hours. But again, thanks again. We really appreciate coming online and sharing with our group. And uh, I will, uh, I'll update, I'll send out emails on ne next month and the upcoming meetups we're planning. And again, good to see everyone again. Spread the word. We'll try to keep growing our community here thank you so thank much you. thank you thank you thank you